This conference will now be recorded. So today we are going to discuss this talk regarding female genital limitation from 2017, uh, October 2017, tackling female genital mutilation in UK. This talk is very important because there is some information which is not there in the GPG, okay? So that's why uh, it's better to be well versed with this talk. So the first definition of female genital mutilation, it comprises all procedures that involve the removal or injury to any part of female genital organs for non-therapeutic reasons, okay? So each word of this definition is important. So removal or injury for non-therapeutic reasons, okay? Worldwide, the estimated problem is almost 125 million women have undergone FGM and every year, almost 3 million women are at risk of FGM. The common age group at which uh, FGM is performed is 0 to 15 years. It is someone's mic is on. One minute. Okay. So it is usually performed in the age group of 0 to 15 years. Regardless of the age at which it is performed, the FGM is have severe physical and psychological consequences. Infibulation is the most extreme form. Now don't confuse with most common, okay? It is most extreme form of FGM and it constitutes around 10% of all procedures. While uh, the countries where FGM is more common, like Somalia, Djibouti or Sudan, infibulation is involved in almost 30% of FGM procedures, okay? Because this is a SBA. Now, what are the types of this FGM? So there are four types you can see. So type one, where there is a removal of clitoral hood. Type two, there is excision of clitoris along with labia minora. Okay. But a part of a labia minora or whole, but no uh, involvement of labia majora in this type two. Type three, it is also known as infibulation. It is excision of part or all of the external genitalia and then stitching it together so which makes narrowing of this vaginal opening and then type 4 which does not fit into the all these three parts is type 4 so it can be either piercing or any injury to the genital female genital tract okay like kicking piercing any incision or scraping burning cauterizing so which doesn't fit in type 1 type 2 type 3 they come under type 4 so these are these four types of FGM. Now, what are the reasons why this FGM is performed? So it can be because of tradition, religional beliefs. And in those religional beliefs, the main reason cited are preservation of virginity and chastity. Okay. And then socioeconomic reasons. Like uh, uh, in some communities, like people don't marry the woman who don't have undergone this FGM. So for that reason also, uh, they uh, even if they don't want to uh, do this FGM to their children, they do because there will be no one to marry their girl, girl children. Then hygiene and aesthetics. So these are the some reasons for which FGM is performed. Now, how this procedure is done? So usually it is done by traditional birth attendant or by elderly woman of the community. In urban areas or some affluent families, it is done by the health personnel. Instruments used commonly are scissors, scalpels, and pieces of gla glasses or razor blades, which are rarely sterilized. And anesthesia is seldom used. Here, basically, the force is used to restrain the woman or the girl. Now, what are the effects of this FGM on sexual intercourse and childbirth? If the infibulation has been done, then the woman may have to go through the days or weeks or even months of gradual dilatation by her husband during sexual intercourse. Sometimes if this is also, uh, even with this also, if the intercourse is not possible or penetration is not possible, then recutting is done before the intercourse. During childbirth, again, uh, defibrillation has to be done. And then after defibrillation, again, they do refibrillation. That is, they will suture the uh, genitalia in the same position as that of the previous. So it is also called as reinfibrillation. So because of this uh, repeated uh, defibrillation and reinfibrillation, again, it will be long-standing physical, psychological, and sexual consequences on the 
uh, woman. Now, what are the risks associated with this FGM? So, in one study, actually, the mortality rate uh, studies are not there, but there was one study from Yemen where the date rate they have observed is around 2.3 percent. That is, mortality is around 2.3 percent. Short term complications with all types of FGM, it includes hemorrhage, urinary retention, infection, and genital swelling. Le uh, the con uh, consequences of infibulation. They include difficulty during urination and menstruation, recurrent urinary infections, excessive growth of scar tissue at the site, renal tract calculi caused by obstruction and repeated infection, and dyspareunia. Obstetric complications of FGM are risk of prolonged labor, postpartum hemorrhage, and perineal trauma. Also, a study by WHO, it has found an increased risk of cesarean section, stillbirth, and neonatal death. So all these are the obstetric complication and this is most commonly asked question regarding this FGM. Psychological and sexual consequences of FGM are nightmares, insomnia, post-traumatic stress disorders, panic attacks, chronic anxiety, loss of self-esteem, depression and anorgasm. Now, what is the legal aspect of this FGM in UK? This is the, I think in every exam, there will be some question regarding this legal aspects of FGM, okay? So, according to FGM Act 2003, it is an offense for a UK national or a permanent UK resident to carry out FGM abroad or to aid, abate, counsel or procure the carrying out of FGM abroad even in countries where the practice is legal okay so i'm reading the sentences as like it because this is the taken directly from the law okay so you should know this sentences by heart or at least you should uh, you should know the all sentences as it is okay because these there are the emqs those are asked on these questions or in these sentences like that only so under this act a person is guilty of an offense if they excise infibulate or otherwise mutilate the whole or any part of girls or women's labia majora minora or clitoris except for necessary operations performed by a registered medical practitioner on physical and mental health grounds now those physical and mental health grounds are important because the female cosmetic surgery comes in this act okay so under this ground female cosmetic genital surgery is performed okay and or an operation performed by a registered medical practitioner or midwife on a woman who is in labor or had just given birth for the purpose of connected with the labor and the birth so here comes the episiotomy and all the uh, perineal suturing okay so this is the female this is this exemptions for female cosmetic surgery and the perineal suturing okay now what about reporting of this fgm Okay, this is also very important. So, it is an act known as Serious Crime Act 2015. Okay, so the reporting is done under this. Okay, if you don't report, it comes under this act, Serious Crime Act 2015. Why, why I'm stressing on it? Because this year they have asked the act regarding that aviation, this thing. Uh, so, they can ask anything. So, that's why I'm repeating this act again. Serious Crime Act 2015 is for the reporting okay and this female genital mutilation act is just for the prosecution like if if anybody is involved in fgm then it is female genital mutilation act 2003 and if anybody fails to report then it is serious serious crime act 2015 hope i'm clear okay so this act uh, uh under this act it is this introduced mandatory reporting of FGM, including genital piercings, in girls under 18 years by regulated professionals, that is healthcare workers, teachers, or social work workers in England, so England or Wales, to the police within one month of confirmation, but preferably by the next working day. So it is the responsibility of the healthcare worker to report it to police, but for whom? Girls under 18 years of age. So all this is important. So more than 18 years, police reporting is not required, okay? So it is mandatory reporting of FGM in girls under 18 years to police and usually within one month, but preferably by the next working day. Now, the professional who has identified the case of FGM, 
that professional has a personal duty to inform the police directly by calling or not one the non emergency police number so the healthcare worker if you are a doctor and if you have identified the case of mgm you have to report it to the police if it take if the girl is less than 18 years of age here you have to provide the girl's name date of birth address as well as contact detail for themselves that means who is reporting and the safeguarding lead of the trust okay they should inform the local safeguarding lead and ensure that all decisions and actions have been clearly documented okay and all this is i'm telling for our girls under 18 years of age doctors have been advised by gmc that complying with this duty to report a gm it will not breach the confidentiality issue okay so it doesn't come under breaching of confidentiality reporting fgm to the police when the girl is less than 18 years of old it doesn't come under breaching of confidentiality okay now what if the female is more than 18 years of age so now it became mandatory in october 2015 for all clinicians in acute trust okay in acute trust it is mandatory since july 2015 mental health trust and general practice to record any identifiable case in the patient's clinical notes and submit patient identifiable data for collection so more than 18 years of age you have to report the so you have to enter the data you don't have to report the police okay but you have to enter enter the data without anonymization so with name and identification you have to enter the data so this data is sent to health and social care information center where it will be anonymized analyzed and published in aggregate form the patient should be informed of this that means she the data will not be anonymized okay so that her name will be informed and given the leaflet more information about fgm she can raise the objection to her data being submitted at this time or retrospectively so if she wants to raise the objection she can raise but you have to submit you ha you have the duty to submit the data there is no requirement for referral to social services or the police now more than 18 years of age there is no requirement to refer to social services or the police rather each case should be assessed individually to determine whether there are any safeguarding risk okay so only you have to do the safeguarding so you have to assess her safety by safeguarding tool and if necessary you have to inform social service or police but yes less than 18 years you have to inform to the police excuse me what happens if she objects then do we report or do we not see if she objects the, uh, to enter the data actually fgm should be entered because it is the this thing no so you have to enter without you if she object she can raise the objection to the trust but it is your duty to enter the data okay she can object to the trust and it will be the uh, she, her complaint will be taken and it will be processed so that will be a different thing but you have to uh, this thing you have to enter the data uh, without anonymization it's your duty okay if she has to raise the objection she has to raise it with the trust okay it's not you are so we have to the... enter without anonymization that means we yes. are entering her name with the data yes yes you are going to enter the data okay now if she doesn't want she has to enter to the uh, she has to raise her complaint to the trust okay it's not your personal thing okay so you have to enter because because it's your okay. personal duty to enter the data okay okay good thank you yeah. now regarding female genital cosmetic surgery so it refers to non medically indicated cosmetic surgical procedures that changes the structure and appearance of healthy external or internal genitalia such procedures include vaginal tightening labioplasty and increasing the size of the g spot now although some procedures they are carried out for medical reason most of the reasons most of the procedures they are purely cosmetic okay or to confirm the cultural norms so here what is the rules regarding this female genital cosmetic surgery so now as i told you it is usually done on the basis of physical or mental health okay to improve the physical or mental health of that female so here you have to clearly document the physical or mental health reasons for which this surgery has to be taken place or you are going to do the surgery and also it is uh, important that any cosmetic genital surgery should not be carried out on a woman or girls under the age of 18 years 
because it is thought that full genital development occurs at around 18 years of age. So no genital cosmetic surgery should not be done before 18 years of age. Okay. And if you are doing any cosmetic surgery, you have to cite the full reasons, whatever physical or mental. Now, what is this management of FGM patients? So when uh, the woman is non-pregnant, okay? So in that case, woman should be offered, offered a referral for psychological review, sexual health screen, and HIV and hepatitis testing. Woman should be examined by an experienced practitioner with a chaperone and type of FGM is recorded. If type 3 FGM, that is infibulation, is identified, then woman should be counseled regarding benefits of deinfibulation de because it will make it easier to take the smears or if she requires any further examination. So it, it is there they are being able to perform smear test if indicated and ameliorating the ability to have penetrative sex and vaginal delivery. So if type 3 FGM is identified, then you can discuss regarding deinfibulation also. Now, for pregnant woman, whenever you identify a case of FGM, so what is the proportion of FGM? So 1.5% of women each year giving birth in England and Wales, they have undergone FGM. So percentage of FGM patients in uh, uh, who are pregnant is 1.5%. Every woman, irrespective of country of origin, should be asked about the history of FGM at their booking visit. So this is for screening. It is most important. So every woman should be asked regarding FGM in her antenatal booking visit. Each obstetric unit, it should have a safeguarding risk assessment tool and it should be aware of at-risk groups likely to have undergone this FGM. If any case of FGM is identified, the first step is to inform and educate the family and provide support and clinical care of the woman. Okay, so first procedure is to inform the family, educate the family and provide support. But However, all clinicians have a legal duty to document the type of FGM in the clinical notes and report the case non anonymize to the Health and Social Care Information Center. So as I previously also told you, it is a legal duty. So you have to inform whatever the woman objects or not. It's her question and she will raise it with the trust. But you have the legal duty to document it. Okay. Now for antenatal care. Every trust should have a named consultant obstetrician and a midwife responsible for the patients for this FGM uh, patient care. Women should be referred for full physical and psychological assessment and safeguarding. The type of FGM should be identified and documented clearly in the notes. If type 3 FGM is identified, then Deinfibulation. Deinfibulation means division of labial scar tissue in the midline upwards to the point of urethral meatus. So it should be offered between 13 to 20 weeks of gestation. Why? Because to allow the labia to heal before delivery. The raw edges then can be overseen bilaterally with absorbable suture material. So division and then raw edges should be overseen. The procedure should be performed under local anesthesia in minor procedure room or some women may prefer general anesthesia to avoid any flashbacks. Women should be informed explicitly that reinfibulation will not be undertaken as it is against the law. This is also a repeatedly asked question. So if patient wants reinfibulation, you have to refuse it. Now, what about the intrapartum care? So the care, the delivery of the woman will be in the obstetric unit. Remember well, it will be in the obstetric unit, okay, with resources recourse to emergency obstetric care. However, a woman who has previously had an uncomplicated vaginal delivery, she can be considered as a low risk, and she can be she can have her delivery in midwife led unit also. So this is also a repeatedly asked AMQ. So a multi para patient who has a, a case of FGM. But she has she had previously two or three vaginal deliveries. So yes, she can be delivered in midwifery led unit. While a PIME with FGM, definitely she will be delivered in she will be carried in obstetric unit. If a woman chooses to have deinfibulation during labor, then her request should be respected. Like the patient, if patient doesn't want uh, this deinfibulation in antepartum, okay, no problem. She can have the choice of having this deinfibulation during intrapartum. 
the procedure can be performed under local or regional anesthesia if needed to facilitate urethral catheterization and vaginal examination now intrapartum when you want to do this the infibulation so here depending upon her circumstances like if you can do the parvaginal examination then you can do at the time of crowning okay or if you can't do the parvaginal examination and urethral catheterization then this infibulation should be done in first stage of labor okay a mediolateral episiotomy should be undertaken if necessary and sutured in the same way as the woman without fgm an agreed plan of care for de infibulation should be documented if an elective cesarean section is planned so if the patient is for elective cesarean section then you have to counsel her for de infibulation and you can do it while during after doing the cesarean section or after the cesarean. if the patient undergoes emergency cesarean section then also you have to document that when the patient wants de infibulation or the when the if the patient doesn't want de infibulation okay but the plan of care should be always documented now what about this postpartum care so if a baby girl is delivered the self guarding assessment tool should be filled out so you have to see whether that female child or any other female child in her, uh, of her previous female child if they are at the risk of fgm and in that case self guarding should be done and this entry maternal history of fgm is recorded in the child's health record that is called as red book okay so now this red book is for both male and female okay so this red book is a routine red book for any uh, uh, newborn in the uk okay under nhs so you have to make an entry of maternal history of fgm in the red book and you have to inform also her gp and health visitor okay so that they will do the further self guarding if in case of a baby girl when a defibrillation is done during labor then a further follow up examination is required at 2 to 4 weeks later to ensure that the labial walls have not re refused okay so that also if de infibulation done during intrapartum then you have to make a follow up visit at 2 to 4 weeks later so this is regarding the postpartum care of this fgm so this is regarding the fgm talk now we'll go to the questions this is the first question type in your chat box during routine booking antenatal visit which group of women should be asked about the history of fgm this is the easiest question i don't think there is any difficulty in this yes all women irrespective of their country of origin they should be asked okay so it is a routine booking question answer is d next a 26 year old woman books for antenatal care at 8 weeks and on examination she is found to have type 3 fgm you have documented this in her notes provided appropriate counseling fulfill the legal requirements what would be the best approach to managing this patient fgm to reduce its consequences on the pregnancy and labor yeah yes so de infibulation at 13 to 20 weeks so ideally this should be done if the patient doesn't want at uh, uh, during antenatal then intrapartum de infibulation so whenever in pregnancy always antenatal de infibulation is preferred so this is regarding this fgm talk hope it was it's useful for you so tomorrow we will come on uh, tomorrow okay i will inform you if tomorrow any class is there or not okay otherwise we will definitely meet on wednesday okay okay thank you Mama, what is it?